It seems like I get every other terrible condition that runs in the family, and of course, narcolepsy is one of them. You may know of narcolepsy from TV shows and movies, where it will be used as kind of comic relief. A character will be in an important business meeting or meeting the parents of their new partner, and then all of a sudden they conk out, and somebody is very offended by this, Larry David style. It's a good Seinfeld sort of bit, it's very funny, but... It's a more complicated disease than just passing out at random. In my case in particular, I don't typically just conk out at random, although it has been known to happen. The last time this happened, and the most fun one, was in Cincinnati a couple years ago, seeing the band's Blood Incantation and Full of Hell. I passed out in the middle of Blood Incantation set on their monitors, and thankfully nobody woke me up, uh, not that they could have at that moment, most likely, or threw me out for being drunk. I was not in fact drunk, but it would have been a very easy assumption to make. Thankfully, when Full of Hell took the stage, uh, I woke up and snapped back to life. It was a good night and a good time, but passing out on the monitors is indeed quite an embarrassing experience, I'm here to confirm. Another common representation of narcolepsy, usually for gag purposes, is cataplexy. Cataplexy is when you lose all muscle tone in your body and collapse. Not pass out, you usually don't lose consciousness, but you collapse in response to, say, laughter or shock or fear or a surge of strong emotions. Thankfully, this is something I don't yet seem to have, although narcolepsy does apparently get worse over time in some people, and I seem to be one of those people, so who knows. In retrospect, the first sign that I would probably have some sleep problems later in life actually came fairly early, from sleepwalking. And of course, I don't remember anything about that. After all, I was asleep, but I have heard the stories again and again, because my parents love telling them. But I'm beating you to the punch this time, Mom and Dad, because my whole audience is about to know the Virginia story. It's actually not that complicated. Uh, we were on vacation in Virginia, and in the middle of the night, they hear a loud bonk noise. That bonk, as it turns out, was my head hitting a wall in my sleep. So, can embarrass me this time, parents. I'm not sure if sleepwalking and narcolepsy are really related, but I do know that by the time I was 12 or 13, I had stopped sleepwalking entirely. But I've always had something of a complicated relationship with sleep. In my teens, I started to sleep a whole lot. I mean, it's not uncommon for a teenager, but I think the extent to which I did it was quite abnormal. For example, I have a cousin, and this cousin is also narcoleptic. This cousin, when I was 20 years old, called me, and I quote, the sleepinest motherfucker I've ever met. I was sleeping probably 20 hours a day at this point. But for some reason or another, I feel like that's only the precursor to narcolepsy. I don't know if that was true narcolepsy. I just know that I was always tired and sleepy. But when narcolepsy hit, I think the signs were kind of undeniable. It hit in waves. I think the first wave was when I was in university, a time of very high stress. I would start to get sleep paralysis. I would start to get very unusually vivid dreams that I seemed to wake up from and be in, to some extent or another. And this was a thing that continued for a while and led up and then came back with a vengeance, as is tradition with these sorts of things. Narcolepsy also has what I would call terrifying complications. Things you may think of pretty quickly, and other things you may not. One example of the things you would think of quickly is, say you're having a sleep attack, suddenly passing out, while cutting vegetables, or while standing over an oven, or in a car, driving. Those are all terrifying complications. But you may not think so much of the nighttime hallucinations, which a lot of us get. Me personally, I don't get a lot of sleep attacks, but... I get hallucinations pretty much every single night. If you've ever had these types of hallucinations, or really any type, you know how terrifying they can be. You can be in a dream where all kinds of crazy stuff is happening, and then suddenly you are awake and the dream is still going. Of course, it usually very quickly comes to an end, but you may see spiders all over the place before that point, and if you're particularly afraid of spiders, as I am, you might also, say, 
to scream at the top of your lungs. Or you may do another thing that I have found myself doing very frequently upon hallucinating, and before you realize you've even moved, you have jumped out of bed and turned on the lights. As if the lights are going to make the spiders suddenly go away, instead of, like, making them a whole lot easier to see, and therefore even scarier. Another interesting complication of narcolepsy is that sometimes you can take medication that helps one thing and makes some other aspect of narcolepsy even worse. Uh, for example, I started SSRIs this year, and while they have made my life a whole lot better in a lot of ways, when I first started taking them, a curious thing would happen where when I fell asleep, I would be asleep for, let's say, an hour or so, and then I would wake up, sort of, and it would be almost like sleepwalking or sleep talking. I would be essentially blackout drunk. That's the only thing I can compare it to, being blackout drunk. And that led to some very interesting situations and conversations, but of course, over time, as I got used to the medication, that sort of stopped. Although it was kind of like a terrifying at first that when I started this medication, there seemed to be another version of me coming out after being asleep for like an hour, and I would have no idea. See, when you suffer from something like narcolepsy, there's just many different mental aspects to it. On the one hand, the hallucinations, disrupted sleep, the excessive daytime sleepiness, the lack of medications that seem to work for it, all of these things combine into a real mess that lowers your quality of life dramatically a lot of the time. But then, it's also just pretty fascinating. It's just pretty interesting to have these sorts of experiences that a lot of people just can't relate to because they're not narcoleptic. I think the estimate was one in every 2,000 people in America have narcolepsy. So it's pretty rare, at least like by the standards of other diseases, illnesses, uh, whatever you want to call it. And I am as fascinated by it as I am horrified by it a lot of the time. You ever wonder why my hair is always so messy in videos? I'll give you a hint, that's not intentional. It's because I have to take like three or four naps every single day. I'll get out of the shower and be like, oh wow, it's 9 a.m., I just woke up, I just got out of the shower. Well, ooh, time for a nap. <sighs> And it's not even really that much of an exaggeration. Uh, there have been plenty of times where I've had a nap of, let's say, two or three hours, woke up, got prepared to do something, and then immediately was hit with another wave of, okay, I need to, like, fall asleep now. And if you're wondering what happens when you get, like, a wave of sleepiness and don't listen, well, those sleep attacks where you just suddenly pass out they become a whole lot more likely. If I ignore my body telling me, hey, you need sleep, you need a nap, like, right now, I become at a much greater risk of just conking out all of a sudden. And oh, my friends, my friends, let me tell you, there is not enough coffee in the world. I am on my third cup of very, very strong coffee today, and yet uh, I also had probably something like I don't know, 25 hours of sleep over the last, like, 36 hours. So, actually, there's probably a little bit more to it than just narcolepsy, maybe some related form of hypersomnia, but there has been a whole lot of napping in spite of my best efforts to keep the coffee flowing. And that paradoxical effect has even applied to Adderall, which I was prescribed because my doctors at one point thought I had ADHD, actually at multiple points. Um, it didn't work. It didn't work at all. I'm probably like the only person you know who's ever taken Adderall at normal therapeutic doses and like immediately passed out after it kicks in. I think that in a lot of cases, people are really underestimating what exactly it means to be narcoleptic. They don't understand how overwhelming the need is to sleep when you are narcoleptic at practically all times. I can tell you that even at my healthiest these days, um, I still, at any given time, will feel like it's three in the morning. Now, technically, uh, as I'm recording this, it's, it's four in the morning, so that this time it's accurate. But throughout the day, on an average day, at any point, it's going to feel like it's about 3 a.m. for the average person. It's just an overwhelming amount of tiredness that makes it hard to do 
much of anything. It's almost like being depressed. You ever been in a deep depression? I'm sure some of you have. And if you haven't, you at least know of those deep depressions that make it hard to do anything but sleep. It's kind of like that, except in this case, as a narcoleptic, it's probably the narcolepsy making you depressed, if anything. Although, I'm not depressed, thankfully. But, you know, it looks very similar from the outside. It's very hard to get yourself to do things while narcoleptic, because everything just seems like a Herculean effort. Just staying awake is a Herculean effort. It's very difficult indeed. There's also the interesting fact that when you sleep as much as a narcoleptic does, your sleep patterns tend to get very messed up, as shown by the fact that I am recording this video at 4 in the morning, because, well, my sleep patterns are messed up thanks to being narcoleptic. Although, I must say, the average narcoleptic person gets as much sleep as the average person in a, any individual night. It's just that that doesn't really make the body feel normal. You're still fatigued, you still want sleep during the day, and it, it just never goes away. It's always there. It's, it's always there. Narcolepsy is also really disruptive when it comes to work, especially, because let's say you work a brainy kind of job. Let's say you're a software engineer. You need all the brain power you can get to write good software. And when you are waking up multiple times a night hallucinating, you may not have access to that so easily. Then there is the fact that it's going to be very difficult to hold down any kind of normal job, that you have to work 8, 10, 12 hours in a row, or even more than that if you're in, say, medicine or, I assume, some other really difficult fields. Because if you're working that many hours in a row, you can reach the point where you just conk out, even if you don't normally do that, because you haven't been able to have your daily naps. Unless you find a medication that reduces the symptoms and side effects of being narcoleptic, it can be very hard to function at all. Thankfully, I was always employed with part-time jobs, so I had plenty of nap time between my various shifts, and then I started like making a living through social media, so that made it easy to work on my own hours. But most people who have narcolepsy aren't that lucky. And you can see on narcolepsy forums uh, all across the internet that people talk a lot about how they've lost their jobs and their livelihoods and their homes because there's just no treatment that really works for it in a lot of cases. There are different types of narcolepsy. This is a very recent update, it seems like. I don't remember types being a thing in the past. There's type 1 and type 2, and then unspecified. I'm not sure what makes unspecified different than type 1 or type 2. I'm guessing that's why it's unspecified. Type 1 seems to be the one that runs in families, although there's a complication to it in that it very often includes cataplexy, which as far as I'm aware, no one in my family has yet. Uh, type 2, they're not really sure what the cause of that is. We have more positive identifications of causes for type 1, which seems to be autoimmune in origin, that your immune system attacks certain parts of the brain responsible for regulating sleep, and that causes a big old mess. Uh, type 2, again, we're not really sure. Most cases of narcolepsy seem to be sporadic and thus not running in families, but we don't know what causes that, really. So there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions about narcolepsy, although we are getting closer and closer all the time to answering these questions. And there are new medications coming out, so it's not like this is a disease that is necessarily going to mess up the lives of everybody who has it. I mean, there are plenty of people who have it that are functional in some way or another, whether they have medication or not. And then there are people like me who are basically entirely non-functional and just want to sleep all the time. As I said earlier, narcolepsy is a very fascinating disease to have because it gives you very unique experiences not a lot of people can relate to. I want to return again to all the weird nighttime experiences. Hallucinations can happen either when you're falling asleep or waking up from sleep. And if you've ever had, say, exploding head syndrome, you may have a good idea of what it's like to hallucinate falling into sleep. Um, exploding head syndrome, if you've never had it, is essentially just a person is falling asleep and they hear, like, a loud booming sound in their head and wake up. It's something like that. I mean, there are various presentations to it. 
Sometimes when falling asleep, I will hear random sounds like running water in my head, which is a very odd thing to hear coming from your own head. Or I will hear, um, let's say, a song that, that doesn't really exist. It's like not a real song. It's something your brain has made up in the moment. Or last night, um, I was drifting off. I was just on the edge of the sleep world when all of a sudden I experienced multiple red flashes. And that's kind of scary. Like that, That's sort of eerie and bizarre, but not uncommon, that sort of thing. Like Your hallucinations can vary between odd sounds, normal sounds. You can, you can see things. It's very all over the place. It's it's just very interesting to see how the mind works, or I guess in this case, how it goes wrong, how it makes you experience things that in your waking life, you're just not going to have the experience of so much. Naturally, I think we should end this video on a brief discussion of sleep paralysis. I may find it very interesting and funny that as somebody who doesn't drive, I will sit up in the middle of the night and ask my wife where I parked my car, but uh, it's probably not that interesting for you to hear about. So let's talk about sleep paralysis, which is indeed strongly associated with narcolepsy. In fact, everybody in my family has had it more than once, including me. I've had sleep paralysis so many times in my life, I couldn't really tell you about the first time it happened. I could probably estimate that it happened somewhere around 18 or 19, but I couldn't tell you what exactly it was about. There is one experience from eight years ago that kind of sticks with me, though, because I had been in some very stressful situations, to say the least, and then I moved to New York with a friend, and I was very out of my element. I was across the country from everything and everyone I knew in a completely new place. It was very disorienting. I didn't... I didn't have any experience with this place. It was very different and very uncomfortable. But I was in a good room in a gigantic house that was old and creepy. And of course, that led to sleep paralysis like the first day I was there. I passed out in the middle of the day and slept a very long time and would eventually wake up at night. But waking up was not that easy because... I was in sort of like a semi-dream state. I was half dreaming, half awake, and the dream was very vivid indeed. I was in a dark room on a futon. In the real world, of course, I was in a dark room on an actual bed. But you know how dreams are. And all of a sudden, the woman from the ring comes up. You know the one, the one with the long dark hair and the, the, the weird nightgown thing. That person, I've never even seen the ring, so I have no idea why my brain chose this particular image. Anyway, she crawled on top of me and was breathing right in my face. I could feel the breath. And I remember going, well, guess this is it then. And as soon as I had that thought, I was released from the nightmare. It just, I woke up immediately and was able to move again. So, I guess if you're ever experiencing sleep paralysis, just give up! But of course, my own favorite tale of sleep paralysis in my family is not my own, it's my uncle's. My uncle uh, was taking a new medication, and it made his sleep paralysis worse and more frequent. One time, he had this experience of seeing the devil in his room at the end of his bed. He saw the devil, and the devil came up to him and laughed at him. It was a creepy experience. It, it became like family lore. And of course, as a boomer, he always tells the story in a way that ends with, actually, it was his wife. Because, yes, he has to do that. It, it's always going to be something misogynistic at the end of these stories. But I think the story itself is fascinating uh, for a long time. It just happened when I was a kid, and they wouldn't tell it around the kids for a long time. Uh, then, of course, we all started experiencing sleep paralysis, and he was able to finally tell the story. But it's a, it was some fascinating stuff. I, it was very vivid, apparently. Like, this one went on for a while, too. He said, the sleep paralysis devil would not release him. And uh, I love that story. And I hope 
Nobody out there ever has to experience that because, Jesus Christ, that sounds terrifying. Like, you know, my uncle is not a scared man at all. Like, this guy is, he can go through anything and, and come out of it just, like, completely okay, unbothered, moisturized in his lane. But uh, in this one case, he was, like, really bothered by it. So I hope none of you ever has that experience. And yeah, I guess that's all. I guess that's everything. We've covered everything. If you got any interesting questions, you know, give me those in the comments. If you have any crazy stories about sleep paralysis or narcolepsy or other sleep disorders, hey, talk about those in the comments. Just leave a comment because because this video is amazing. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Have a great one.